You're listening to the Men's Rea podcast, and this is the story of James Bulger. On the 12th of February 1999, James Bulger was a month away from his third birthday. He was the only child of Ralph and Denise Bulger, who'd been married three years previously at the local registry office, after the loss of their first child, Christy, by miscarriage. Denise thought that this loss might have been the cause of her overprotectiveness of James. He was always with her. James was fair, with dark blonde hair, and he had blue eyes, though one was slightly flecked with brown. On that day he was wearing a grey tracksuit, a white, knotty t-shirt, with blue and green stripes, white puma running shoes, and all over that a navy blue anorak coat with a blue and yellow scarf with white bobbles at either end. That morning the family rose together and set about their tasks before heading to Denise's mother's house. Denise was the second youngest from a family of 13 siblings, and her mother was of 10 children. Her mother's house served as a meeting point for the whole family, and although Denise's mother wasn't home when they arrived, one of Denise's sisters was there with her daughter. The children played together while the sisters chatted. Ralph was one of the many long-term unemployed, which was not unusual in the early 90s in Liverpool. He had dropped Denise and Jamie at her mother's house and carried on to see Denise's brother, Paul, to help him with assembling some furniture. Paul's partner, Nicola, was minding another niece that morning, but needed to go into the local shopping mall, the Strand, to exchange some items of clothing. She went by the mother's house and asked Denise if she would help her out by sitting in the back of the car with the child, as she'd no baby seat in the car. Denise agreed and after lunch, the two women and children piled into the car and drove off to the Strand. They parked in the multi-storey car park and went in. They let the two little ones ride on a mechanical seesaw and wandered around the shops. They all went into TJ Hughes and Nicola exchanged the items she had with her. For a brief moment, Jamie went out of sight of his mother. He frightened himself and cried out before quickly catching sight of his mother again. They continued walking around the shopping centre, going from shop to shop, stopping to buy the children's sausage rolls. The children enjoyed a ride in a shopping cart, and Jamie messed around in a children's clothing store before being marched outside by his mother for being unruly. James wandered around for a bit outside the shop, but Denise spotted a suspicious-looking man nearby on a bench and took hold of his hand before heading off to look through another store with the other two girls. James was getting more and more rowdy as they wandered around the shops. He got into trouble and earned a quick smack on his legs for his poor behaviour. At 3.35, the four entered a butcher's shop, which was quiet. Denise was relieved that this was the case as she was getting self-conscious of James's poor behaviour. She saw him playing in the entranceway and turned to open her purse to pay for the meat they had selected. When she turned around again, James was gone. Denise went outside the shop and looked around for James. She couldn't see him and returned to Nicola, beginning to panic. The shop assistant noticed that something was wrong and asked what was the matter. The women told the assistant that the little boy had gone missing, and he told them to go report it to the security desk and gave them directions. It was about 3.45 when Denise and Nicola reached the security desk and reported James as missing. They had checked into a few shops on the way there to see if anyone had seen the little boy. Reports of missing children were quite common in the shopping centre, but that day had been quiet, and James was the first missing child reported that day. James's description was relayed around the shopping centre, and the search for him widened. Usually missing children were found within 15 to 20 minutes of the report being made. Everything thus far was routine and ordinary. The shops were searched again. At a quarter past four, there was still no sign of James. The Marsh Lane police station was called. It was twenty to five before the first police officer arrived. Quickly, the policewoman realised that James had been missing for nearly an hour at this stage, and the situation was a bit more serious than the routine missing child case, where they usually turn up after twenty or thirty minutes. After radioing in the description of Jamie again, emphasising the length of time he'd been missing, the Strand Mall was searched yet again, focusing on areas that a small child might be drawn to like the pet shop and toy store. A cleaner in the mall came forward stating that he had heard of another child going missing for a short while at the same time as James. When that child was reunited with its parents, he said that there was a man in a white coat who had tried to entice him into a car. After reports of James's disappearance aired on local radio, there was another tip, this one anonymous, that a ponytailed man had been in the vicinity who was suspected in the abduction of children. The search for James ramped up very quickly. The media and local transport services were informed, and the area immediately surrounding the mall was searched. The car that the four had arrived in was opened and searched. 
a police officer on a motorcycle with a PA system drove the streets, announcing that there was a missing child and to be on the lookout. Police took Denise back to the station to await news while they searched and tracked down Ralph Bulger to inform him that his son was missing. Senior officers gathered, getting up to date on what actions had been taken and arranging another thorough search of the mall, just as Ralph Bulger arrived at the station. He had found out that James was missing when he visited his mother-in-law's house and found that James and Denise weren't there. The man with the ponytail, who was known to the police, had been located and cleared of suspicion. Though he was at the shopping mall that day, it was clear to them that he wasn't involved in James's disappearance. The Bulger's house was searched, although Ralph Bulger was confused as to why the police were bothering searching the home when James was unlikely to have made it back to the house on his own. He collected recent photos of Jamie and gave them to the police. Sightings of Jamie around the town of Bootle and further afield began coming in. Each was recorded to be looked into by one of the growing team of police working James's disappearance. A woman had seen a child along the towpath at the canal. He was crying. At the time, she had assumed that he was with the other children playing along the canal and had carried on her way. But she was upset at the idea that this might have been Jamie and had walked away when she could have stopped to help. The sighting of James by the canal prompted the calling of an underwater search team. They arrived in the morning and searched the canal. It seemed likely that that's where James had ended up, but Denise and Ralph were not told of this development. Another woman contacted the police after seeing a news report on television. She stated that she had seen a young boy matching James's description on Breeze Hill Reservoir while she was walking her dogs. The boy was with two other slightly older boys, and the young one looked as if he had grazed his forehead. There was another sighting at a garage across town around the same time as the dog walker. A young boy was seen with two other boys, this time young teenagers. The man reporting the sighting thought at the time that the youngest boy didn't belong with the older ones. So there were two conflicting sightings now. It seemed possible that James wasn't in the canal after all. If he really was with the older boys at the garage, which seemed more likely because the boys were much older and because the garage was closer to the Strand shopping centre, then there was still hope that James might be found. The search of the Strand had been thorough. All 114 shops had been reopened and searched, and this turned up nothing. The investigation was beginning to stall. Night fell, and in the early hours of the morning, CCTV footage of the mall had been trawled through. The lead officer travelled to the Strand to see the footage, which showed a blurred, low-quality picture of a young boy being led away by two bigger boys and out of the shopping centre. An attempt was made to enhance the images, and the man from the garage was called in to see if he recognised the boys from the image. He couldn't say one way or the other. Either way, it was now clear that James had been taken from the mall and that a serious crime had been committed. He was no longer simply missing from home, suspected of wandering off. A full investigatory team was set up. Denise and Ralph Bulger had returned home overnight and were informed of his abduction when they arrived back at the police station the next morning. They were shown the video in the stills of James with the two older boys. It was difficult to gauge the heights of the two boys, but it was thought that they were in their early teens, maybe a little older, maybe a little younger. It was difficult to be sure. The trawling of the canal was completed that morning and nothing was found, still no James. The police officers tried to spin it as a positive outcome. No body had been found, so it was possible that James was still out there somewhere. But if he wasn't in the canal, where was he? Which sightings were correct? And what had been his route? And where had he ended up? On the Saturday evening, the woman who was walking her dogs was finally interviewed by the police. She described a two- or three-year-old blonde boy with a round face wearing a dark anorak accompanied by two older boys around 10 or 11 years old. She was shown the photo of James and she said that it was similar to the boy that she had seen. It was decided that she had in fact seen James and this suggested a new area of search towards the town of Walton and away from Bootle where the Strand shopping mall was. On the Sunday afternoon, a gang of young kids were playing around Walton Lane Police Station and ended up on the train tracks that ran behind the station. They were trying to get a look at the dogs that were kept in kennels behind the station. They spotted something wrapped up in cloth lying on the tracks. They said it looked like a dead cat. Something wrapped up in a coat, with bricks and stones piled up around it. Then something like a doll's legs. They went closer to figure out what they were looking at. It's a baby, one yelled, and they ran. They ran back up towards Walton Lane Police Station and rushed inside to tell them what they'd found. It was a quarter past three when the police who responded to the group of youths looked over the back wall that backed onto the railway line. A crime scene was set up and the railway line was closed down. James had been instantly recognisable because of the clothing he was wearing. The anorak, the tracksuit, the scarf, they were all visible. 
James had been run over by a train, and the upper half of his body was between the tracks, with the lower half some fifteen foot away, between the tracks and the embankment. The scene was recorded in photographs and video. The body appeared to have been covered with bricks that were dislodged when a train had passed. James's clothes were found to be stained with blood and bluish paint. There was a heavy steel bar, a piece of railway equipment, lying against the bricks. It too was stained with blood. Batteries were scattered across the scene, some blood-stained, and a box of chocolates with some sweets left were found nearby. A tin of blue model-making paint was also found. At 5pm the pathologist arrived and the clothing and bricks could be removed. It was clear that James had sustained severe head wounds. There was blood and more blue paint on the side of his face. The Bulgers had been notified that James's body had been found, and later, when James had been moved to the mortuary, his uncle Ray Bulger had identified his body. It was up to the police now to find out how exactly James Bulger had ended up on the tracks with such head wounds. The post-mortem revealed that James had died from severe head injuries. He had suffered multiple skull fractures, caused by a series of blows to his head. He also had over 20 other separate injuries, bruises, scratches, and cuts on his body. There was no conclusive evidence of sexual assault, but there was hemorrhaging near his rectum, his foreskin appeared, quote, abnormal, and there was a suspicious injury to his mouth that indicated that this may have been the case. On Monday morning, the investigation team gathered in order to plan the path of their inquiries. It was decided that the nature of James's injuries would not be released to the public, only that he had been severed by a train after his death. The lack of information given to the press served to increase the rumours spreading about the little boy's death and inflamed the public. The community was outraged that such a thing could happen to such a small boy. The police needed to identify the two boys that were shown in the CCTV footage, leading James by the hand out of the mall and away from his mother. An incident room for the police to work out of was set up and an evidence room established. They began getting tips about various youths in the area who may have been involved in Jamie's death. There was a startling amount of kids that people thought might be capable of taking part in this horrific crime. The boys who stumbled upon Jamie's body were questioned and dismissed as suspects. They hadn't been near the mall. With all the publicity surrounding the case, a caretaker in the search area decided to check the cameras of his buildings. It was just possible that the boys had passed by that way, and as luck would have it, the three boys were shown walking along a wall in front of the office, the youngest boy being swung between the older two. He contacted the police who stopped by the office. They looked at the video and the low wall the boys had walked past. It was then that the police realised that, due to the low wall, the two boys they were looking for were much shorter than they had originally thought, and most probably a lot younger. That afternoon, Tuesday, the station received a call from a distressed father saying that he thought his son strongly resembled the dark-haired boy in the video. Other people had also commented on the similarities, but the boy wouldn't talk about it. The man was so agitated, he had called from a friend's house and wouldn't give his name or address. He said he'd call them back later. Over a series of phone calls which were recorded and then traced, it emerged that the man had seen his son from a bus on the Friday afternoon when James went missing. His kid had skipped school that day. The mother was trying to cover up for the boy, he said. She would say he was in school, and she had washed his coat to try and destroy evidence. The man finally agreed to bring his son in. He just wanted the whole thing sorted. A team was quickly assembled and went to the address where they entered the house at dinner time. The detectives told the woman who answered the door, the boy's mother, that he was being arrested on suspicion of involvement in the killing of James Bulger. The boy started screaming as he was led to the police car to be brought to the station. Not long after they had left, the police officers who had stayed behind in the house answered a knock on the door, and they were greeted by a television crew, complete with camera. It became clear that the word had gotten out that some development had been made, and a crowd began to grow on the street. It became unruly, and more police had to be called to control the crowd. At the station, samples and fingerprints were taken from the boy. The father was adamant that his son had something to do with the killing, and just as adamant, the mother said he was not. The boy was kept overnight at the police station, and the truth emerged in the morning. The boy had indeed skipped school, and had been seen by his father from the bus near the Strand Mall, but this had happened on Thursday, the day before James went missing. The boy was released. By Wednesday evening, the pressure was mounting on the police to find some answers, not least because of the incident with the innocent boy who had just been released. There were fears that criticism of police handling of the investigation thus far might undermine confidence in the police force, and all the while national and international coverage was increasing. That night, after most of the team had retired to their local pub after work, one of the senior detectives had stayed behind and was informed by one of the uniformed officers that a woman had just called, saying that she thought the boy in the light jacket in the video could be one of her friend's sons, John Venables. 
she thought that the boy in the light jacket in the video could be one of her son's friends, John Venables. She knew that the boy had skipped school with another boy, Robert Thompson, on that Friday, and her son's friend had also come home with paint on his jacket. The woman didn't want to get involved, and said she didn't want to be contacted again. Initially, the detectives were hesitant to repeat the previous episode, but they decided to go out and get her statement in spite of her wishes. They checked the boys' names against their records, but nothing turned up. They began to set up arrests for the next morning, Thursday. Once the statement was given, the headmistress of the boys' school was called in in order to check the details that had been given by the witness. She also confirmed their addresses. The two boys were ten years old. At half past seven, Robert Thompson woke his mother up, saying that there were men at the front door. The four men were police. Two more were around the back of the house in a laneway. They produced a search warrant for the house, and then arrested Robert on suspicion of involvement in the killing of James Bulger. A neighbour from across the street came over to mind the other children while Robert's mother, Anne, went with Robert to the police station. John Venables lived between his mother and father's houses, so two teams of police were sent to each address, not knowing which house John would be in on that morning. When they called at his father's house, his two siblings were there, but John was at his mother's that morning. When they arrived at John Venables' mother's home, she thought that they had called about his skipping school the previous Friday. She mentioned that he'd come home with paint all over his coat. She was asked to go and get the coat. They then told John that he was being arrested on suspicion of his involvement in the killing of James Bulger. John became very upset and was sent to wash and dress before being brought to the station. The clothes that he had been wearing that Friday were located. They had been washed, but the blue paint he had gotten on them hadn't come off. The two boys were brought to separate police stations to be questioned on their whereabouts on the Friday afternoon. The police weren't sure that they had the right boys. They were so young. But they also had John's coat, which was similar to the one in the CCTV footage, and the paint stains. John Venables was born in August of 1982 and was the second son of Susan and Neil Venables. His older brother Mark and younger sister Michelle both had learning disabilities. His parents had separated after Michelle's birth. Both of John's parents suffered from depression at various times, and Susan had once left the children alone for three hours, prompting a visit from the police and the involvement of social workers. In 1989, John began attending Broad Square County Primary School, where it was noted that he had some antisocial behaviour, but nothing too serious. He would complain of being bullied and was sent to see an educational psychologist who said he was unable to concentrate and was generally uninterested. In January of 1991, John's teacher, Miss Bulger, noted that new and worrying behaviour had begun. He would sit at his desk and rock back and forth, or hit his head against the wall, hurting himself. He wouldn't do what he was asked, did no schoolwork, and occasionally ran out of the school. His behaviour also became disruptive at home. He complained of being bullied again. Ms. Bulger was finding it difficult to cope with John and refused to take responsibility for him on a school trip. John had to stay behind. He was referred again to the school psychologist for this strange behaviour and hyperactivity. He would cut himself with scissors or throw things around the classroom. His mother, Susan, wondered if something in his diet might be causing John's difficulties. The psychologist said that that might help, and Susan implemented it. It was also suggested that John be referred to a more senior member of the team. The diet didn't help, but Susan sought no further solution for her son's problems and never took up the other referral. John's poor behaviour in Broad Square continued until he attacked another student. He came up behind the other child and held a wooden ruler to his throat. The child started to go red in the face, unable to breathe. John's teacher and a colleague had to pull John off the pupil. That was the end of John's career at Broad Square. He did not complete his final term there. He was then enrolled in Walton St. Mary's Primary School, in the year below his age group. He was taken in on the condition that he behave himself. He began the new school year in September of 1991 in Mr. Dwyer's class, and it was there that he met Bobby Thompson. Mr. Dwyer was quite strict, and John's behaviour saw an improvement in his class and within its structured environment. The next year, John's parents were giving their relationship another go when John returned to school. He began spending more time shuttling between his mother and father's houses, and he had a new teacher, Ms. Rigg. John and Bobby were still in the same class, and generally behaved well. Ms. Rigg had a soft spot for John despite the fact that he could be disruptive and didn't always do his work. Other people at the school didn't have the same soft spot for John, however. One of the playground supervisors often had to give out to John for annoying other children. When she would reprimand him, he would sometimes hit his head off the wall and fall down and flail about on the ground. He would stop if she ignored him. Other teachers, including the headmistress, saw John as a bully. He was always fighting and calling names. 
Bobby's parents, Anne and Bobby Sr., had married in December of 1971, and in the following nine years had five children together, all boys. Bobby Jr. was one of the younger children. The marriage was volatile from the beginning, and Bobby Sr. would often arrive home from the pub with violent and aggressive behaviour. Anne had been beaten by her own father, and it would seem she was stuck in the cycle of abuse. In 1988, Bobby Sr. left Anne for another woman, and had nothing more to do with his family. Shortly after he left, the family home caught fire and burned down. It was then that Bobby's mum began to drink. She often left the boys unattended, the older ones taking care of the younger. They would hit and bully the younger children. The boys began skipping school and getting involved in petty crime. The Thompson boys developed a reputation that followed them into school, which would later attach itself to Bobby. Some of the boys were in and out of care homes. In 1992, Anne had another little boy and stopped drinking. However, the aggression and crime that dogged their family life didn't end. In school, Bobby was generally well-behaved, though his teacher Ms. Rigg thought that Bobby was sly and often told tales on the other kids. He liked to get the other children in trouble. John and Bobby became fast friends, which was good because most other kids avoided them both. Of all their bad behaviour and reputations, John and Bobby were most notorious for skipping out on school, leaving the premises during playtime or just never showing up at all. It happened often enough that special arrangements had to be made to ensure that the boys didn't leave school. They were kept indoors, in separate rooms at recess, by the resumption of school in 1993, though these measures didn't always work. In late January, a man on his lunch break spotted two boys outside a shop in the Strand Mall. They were tapping on the shop window and beckoning to a small child inside. But the boy ran back to his mother instead of continuing towards the door. Later, this man would identify John Venables as one of those boys. On February 18, 1993, the interviews of the two boys took place in two separate police stations. These interviews were tape recorded, and as the tapes were only 45 minutes long, that was the time allowed for each interview session. The boys were re-cautioned at the beginning of each interview. Both boys initially denied everything, but police informed them that blood had been found on one of Bobby's shoes, and the blue paint found on John's jacket matched the paint that was found on Jamie's face. Bobby had his mother and solicitor present, and through seven interviews, Bobby denied that he had taken any action that resulted in Jamie's death. The questioning lasted two days, and eventually on the second day, Bobby would admit that he had been with the toddler, and had been there when he died. He said that he had just watched John throw rocks and hit Jamie. He had taken no part in the beating that had led to the death of James Bulger, but he hadn't done anything to stop it either. He said he didn't know why John had taken Jamie's hand outside that butcher shop and led him away from his mother. John was also accompanied by his mother and initially denied everything as well, but after a night at the police station, the police who were interviewing him thought that he seemed like he wanted to talk. They thought that perhaps what was making him hold back was that he didn't want to upset his mother with the details of the event. So his father then took over, and John began telling the story. They had spotted the toddler in the shopping centre. They'd gone over and led him away, and then they wandered the streets. The boy had cried for his mummy. John blamed Bobby for a lot of what had happened and tried to diminish his own involvement, but after eight interviews the police thought that they had gotten enough information, and the boys were charged. The boys' first appearance before the court happened on the 22nd of February. They were now known only as Child A and Child B, but their identities were an open secret in the town. The route to the courthouse was lined by reporters, photographers and TV crews, as well as members of the public who screamed obscenities at the cars as the boys were brought by. Six people were arrested. The boys would face trial on the 1st of November, 1993. They were charged with the attempted abduction of another child from the Strand Mall, the abduction of James Bulger, and the killing of James Bulger. The jury would decide whether the manner of death was manslaughter or murder. The court made special arrangements in advance of the trial of Child A and Child B. The floor of the dock where the two boys would be seated with their respective social workers was fitted with a platform so that the boys would be able to see over the bar that would otherwise have obstructed their views. Two private rooms were set aside for the boys, their families, and their legal teams. The seats in the courtroom were now screwed into the floor to prevent their being thrown should any member of the public get ideas into their heads. The court would sit for reduced hours in order to accommodate the attention span of the young boys in the dock. The boys also visited the courthouse the day before in order that they might familiarise themselves with their surroundings and put them more at ease. The boys' picture had been snapped by a journalist on this visit and the papers, with faces pixelated out, would run on the opening day of the trial in a tabloid newspaper. There was a room in a separate building set up in order to accommodate the press that would cover the trial, such was the interest. There was an audio link set up, 
the journalists present were warned that the same rules applied in that room as they did in the court. No talking, no mobile phones, no tape recording would be allowed. To begin with, the defense argued that the proceedings could not go forward because it was impossible that the boys would get a fair trial, due to the amount and nature of the press coverage that the boys' trial had received. The judge agreed that the coverage had been widespread, and some had been prejudicial and misleading. Despite this, he did not think that this would be a bar to the boys receiving a fair trial, as what was to be proved was joint enterprise on the part of the boys. There was one further motion where the defense wanted two photographs removed from evidence, close-ups of James's injuries, but the judge refused this as well. The trial could now begin. The prosecution went about making their case that the boys acted together when they took James, and that they were both responsible for his death. Despite them being only ten years old, they both knew that what they were doing was seriously wrong, and they intended to kill him or cause him serious harm. They also argued that the boys had attempted previously to abduct another toddler. The early part of the day, where the boys had wandered from shop to shop, stealing sweets and troll dolls and tins of craft paint was recounted. The interactions that they had with the staff of those shops was described, and a woman described seeing the boys playing with her toddler in one of the shops near a display of purses. Then the route that the boys had taken from the Strand shopping centre out onto the main street along the canal was described by the prosecution and those that witnessed their travels. Each of the witnesses was upset. They all seemed to have thought that if only they had intervened, they might have saved James from his fate at the hands of the two other boys. Many of the witnesses called gave evidence that differed from their police statements, often exaggerating details and making their testimony more damaging to the boys than was originally recorded by the police. When confronted with this by the defence team, many of the witnesses became angry or upset. The main problem that the lawyers faced was that there was no real defence to be argued for the boys. John Venables had confessed, and forensic evidence put Bobby Shue delivering some of the most serious head wounds. The forensics of the crime scene was described for the jury and the injuries to Jamie's head, the blood on the steel bar, the paint on Jamie's face, and the blood on Bobby's shoes and paint on John's clothing were all described. The evidence put both of the boys there and taking part in the attack on James Bolger. Bobby still denied being anything more than a bystander, and John still insisted it was Bobby who was the ringleader. Psychologists who examined the boys were called to give evidence that the boys were fit for trial. They understood right from wrong, and although both had experienced trauma from unsettled childhoods and were maladjusted, there was nothing really wrong with them. There was no psychological reason for their horrific behaviour to be taken from their assessments. The boys sat in the court throughout. Bobby showed very little emotion, and John seemed to be disconnected from the entire procedure, both seeming anxious at various points and unsure where to look. Their behaviour was generally interpreted as callousness, that they didn't care what was happening to them or what they'd done. More likely, it was the behaviour of two 11-year-old boys who didn't understand what was going on, and who were confused and upset by the ordeal. Denise Bolger was spared having to testify in court. Instead, a statement that she had written was read aloud, lasting about 20 minutes. After all the witnesses had been called, the evidence was examined. The iron bar was passed around the courtroom. The jury was allowed to handle it, to lift it and to feel its weight. The judge warned that it was heavy as it was passed towards the jury. One female member of the jury decided that she did not want to hold it. The pathologist was called in to describe the crime scene and the injuries to James's body. He noted that there was no way to tell which blow exactly had killed James, as there were so many, and there was no way to be definitely sure if James had been sexually assaulted. But it was noted that if he had, one or both of the perpetrators had likely been sexually assaulted in the past, too. The prosecution closed by reiterating that the boys had carried out these heinous acts together and had intended James Bolger serious harm or death. Bobby's defence team argued that what had actually happened was that the boys had done something they thought mischievous, taking a toddler, and once that was done, they were stuck with him. They hadn't had a greater plan, but eventually when it became clear to them that they would be in serious trouble, they hurt and killed James in order to try and cover it up. There was no intent there, no murder. It was pointed out that John had stated, quote, I killed him, not that we killed him, or Bobby killed him, but that John himself had taken responsibility. John's defence team focused on John's narrative and the shift of blame onto Bobby. When the closing statements were completed, the judge took a day and a half to summarise the evidence and testimony for the jurors, and warned them that they were going to ignore the reporting of the trial while they were deliberating. The jury began their work near noon on Wednesday the 23rd of November. 
While deliberations were ongoing, the judge heard a number of applications from media outlets regarding the naming of child A and child B in the reporting of the trial. The most the judge would say was that he would make his decision after the verdict, and he would give no explanation of it, whatever it may be. That evening, the jury filed back into the courtroom. It was anticipated that they would give an update of their progress to the judge before being sent off to a hotel for the night. They were asked about the charges. They responded that they had no answer regarding the first charge of attempted abduction. However, the boys were found guilty on the charges of abduction and murder. The judge announced that he would release the jury from further duties and let the first count lie on file, and that he was varying the identification orders that he had made. That order was quickly passed around the courtroom. The boys could now be named by the press. The two were remanded in custody, in secure units of local children's care homes. Their families had already moved from the local area to avoid gossip and angry crowds. The boys awaited sentencing. The trial judge recommended eight years. Given that they were so young, it would be sentencing them to live the span of their lives again in custody. The Lord Chief Justice raised the tariff to ten years, but due to public pressure, the Home Secretary decided that he would raise it to fifteen years, which would mean that the boys would be twenty-six before they could be released. In March of 1999, the European Court of Human Rights heard an appeal on behalf of the boys and found that their rights had been breached in two ways. Firstly, that they had been tried in an adult court, and secondly, that their sentencing had been decided by a politician rather than an impartial and independent judge. In 2000, their original sentence of eight years was reintroduced, hastening their release. Both of the boys had fairly unremarkable careers in the eight years that they were in custody. In 2001, they won a remarkable case that meant that they would be entitled to lifelong anonymity, and in June of the same year, they were freed with new identities. These identities were well crafted by the government, new names and homes with full histories and pasts. They were never to contact one another, they were to stay out of Merseyside, and they were not to associate with children. By all accounts, it appears as if Robert Thompson has melted back into society, and very little has been heard of him in the press since his release. The same cannot be said for John Venables. Though he did study and find a job, he began to struggle with debt and isolation. His probation officer noted that he spent a lot of time on the internet. It would turn out that he was amassing a large collection of child pornography. In March of 2010, John Venables was returned to prison. The injunction granted in 2001 meant that upon his re-release in 2013, he was granted yet another new identity. His whereabouts and new identity are unknown. Jamie Boulder was a happy child, a month shy of his third birthday, when he was taken from his mother's side that Friday afternoon. Every parent's greatest fear came true that day for the Boulders. Thank you for listening to Mens Rea, a true crime podcast. If you like what you heard, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review, or tell a friend. It really is the easiest way to support your favourite podcasts. Mens Rea is supported in part by our generous listeners on Patreon. Head over to www.patreon.com forward slash mensreapod to see how you can help out and check out the benefits of patronage, like podcast goodies and bonus content. Our theme music is Quinsong First Dance by Kevin MacLeod. This podcast is researched, written, and produced by me, your host, Sinead. All sources can be found in the show notes or by visiting the website www.mensreapod.com. Till next time, don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs>